Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining me today. Uh, my talk is Composable in Action. Uh, my name is Chris Greetings. Uh, I work uh, for Bounty as some SVP of Open Platforms there, um, which mainly consists of me talking about Drupal, but more recently has me talking and thinking about uh, commerce and composable things. Uh, I have been doing Drupal for a long time, and I've been building uh, web applications since like the mid 90s, so I've been doing this a while. Um, as I said, uh, my, my job covers a broad um, swath of things to do, and most recently I've picked up the Composable team, and so I've spent a lot of time over the past year thinking about Composable uh, and what it means. Uh, and uh, you know, recently I gave a talk um, at Design for Drupal um, a couple months ago, and it was you know, a lot, some of the material that I have here today, I, I'm going to repurpose from there. But one of the interesting questions that came out of that talk was, you know, like how do you build the orchestration layer? And I'll define what that is later on. And so what I've done for this talk is I've written, um, you know, just a quick demo to kind of show um, how you can use that orchestration layer in action. Uh, and the off chance that we actually look at code, I don't think the code's all that interesting. Uh, but there's two warnings. One is it's not production ready. Uh, it is merely to demo the you know, demo what an orchestration layer can do. And two is Brian will test. I am not a JavaScript <laughs> developer. It's written in Node and JavaScript, so if you do happen to see it, you probably won't want to use it anyway. I just came here to make sure you said that. This so. is perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So, um, so what is composable? You know, I think as we we go through the talk here, I want to talk about composable um, and um, you know, kind of define it. There's a few ways we can define it. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how Drupal fits in it, and then we'll spend a little more time with one of the specific definitions. But what, what's really interesting to me as I've gotten into this is um, there's a lot of talk about Composable. You know, Gartner talks about it. Um, you know, Dries talks about it. He's written some blog posts and things. And, um, you know, folks like me are thinking about it, talking about it. My clients are talking about it. Um, but there's no real, like, one definition of composable, um, you know, I think broadly of it being, you know, pre-building uh, building blocks that can be used to build experiences quickly. Um, but you know, kind of the start of all this um, was a couple of years ago. Gartner started talking about it, and they didn't really talk about composable as like a technology or an architecture. They really talked about it, you know, being a way to structure a business. And so, um, their definition back then was a composable enterprise is an organization that can innovate and adapt to changing business needs through the assembly and combination of packaged business capabilities, we'll come back to that term, uh, to enable the composable enterprise, organizations will need to adapt the way they source and deliver applications as vendors deliver more modular capabilities. So that's kind of where we started. Uh, and then I think it was like last October that um, I first saw Dries talking about it. Um, and he wrote a blog post uh, where he talked about the composable DXP, right, as opposed to the composable organization. Now, he didn't really write a definition in his blog post, uh, but he laid out some, you know, what he felt were some key principles. Um, and one of the things that I think defines composable DXP, uh, as Dries would talk about it, is it's really a CMS-centric approach, right, to building out a digital experience. Um, Drupal is really good at this, right? It's really good at being composed with DXP, in my opinion, for a variety of reasons. And, and quite honestly, I think it's the best open option that's out there. So, you know, I'm really you know, excited about, you know, this approach that, that Dries has taken. Um, you know, we've got, you know, these principles. So it's like our architecture needs to be modular. Of course, Drupal has, you know, 40,000-ish modules, right? Core is built on modules and things, so it's really part of our DNA. Um, you know, talking about needing them to be discoverable. You know, we have lots of ways to discover things. Uh, you know, even Project Browser now, like there's lots of ways we're trying to push you know Drupal into this <coughs> DSP land. Uh, and there's a number of different you know, um, you know principles here, like the low code, no code. You know, we have um, uh, you know things like you know Acquia has got their site studio. We've got um, you know, a lot of different ways that we can build those things in that, um, in that manner. Now, one of the interesting things to me is, 
for a long time as someone that's um, often touting you know, Drupal and why it's better than you know, say like a content floor or a content stack and things of that nature, is that the headless CMSs have always painted Drupal as you know old, um, you know mature would be the, the word I'd use, but it has all these things and you don't need all these things. Why, why do we have all these things? What's very interesting is that they're all kind of coming around to this, right? So like Contentful just recently added a couple different things. One to build essentially an orchestration layer. Um, the other is to do low code, no code type things. So what we're seeing them do is try to become more of a composable DXP and less of a headless CMS, so to speak. Now, why is Drupal great as a composable DXP? You know, it's modular, right? So you know, we have all these modules, core is modular, uh, we can get a, a million, you know, or 40,000 or so contrib modules. Um, if we don't like those modules, we can build our own, right? So we can build out um, the code in a modular way, which is great. It's open by its nature, right? So we want things to connect to Drupal. Uh, we make it very easy for things to connect to Drupal. Um, you know, and that is, you know, really important as we think about a DXP, because what we want to do with that DXP is not only have um, the CMS, but we want to be able to connect to the CRM, the commerce platform, things of that nature. We want to bring those things into that experience. It's component driven. Um, we've been building component based, um, you know, implementations in Drupal for a long, long time, you know, at least 10 years. Um, for, for my account. Um, so really important for us to be able to take those components and use them as building blocks to rule out that experience. And it's connective. So there are, you know, obviously there are a lot of modules, but not only are there a lot of modules, there are a lot of modules that connect us to different platforms, right? If you want to connect to Salesforce, we use the Salesforce module. If you want to connect to Magento, there's a module for that. Um, Marketo, whatever you want to connect to, there's lots of different modules that we can use. So that's what we think about, or I think about when it comes to a composable DXP. Now for the most part, for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to be talking about composable architecture. Now this is a little bit different than how um, we've been defining the, the composable DXP. Uh, here is a place where there's still lots of definitions that are happening. I happen to have a couple up here. One is from View Storefront. Uh, one is from Content Stack. Um, but if I was going to use my definition, it is <clears throat> that it's a modular approach to building a digital ecosystem that completely separates the front-end channels from the back-end platforms. The separation is accomplished by creating an orchestration layer using modular components that contain the business logic and integrations needed to provide the composed applications with the data and services they needed. Or they need. It's my fault. Lots of stuff going on there. Um, but, but, but ultimately, I think the main parts of this, right, is we want the front end to be decoupled from the back end, right? We don't want things that happen in the back end to affect the front end and vice versa. Um, and we want to be able to orchestrate the middle, we want that business logic in the middle so we can define things as we want to. Um, you know, having a composable um, architecture means that I can swap things in and out without affecting the rest of the system. So if I don't like my CMS or I don't like my commerce platform, um, I can just swap them out, um, and they should just plug and play into the app, into the uh, into the architecture. Um, when I think about you know some of the principles that define a composable architecture, I think about them. I think about four different principles. One is that a composable architecture is uh, front end agnostic. Okay, it's you know, headless. We can say, um, we don't care how they're written. We can deliver in many different ways across many different channels. We don't care how they're written. Uh, as long as they can talk to us via an API, we're good to go. Backend agnostic, um, omni capability. I can have a bunch of different capabilities um, that I use. Um, you know, essentially services um, you know, are capabilities for us here. And we want to be able to use, um, you know, a variety of different capabilities to bring uh, that it brings to life. Uh, capability orchestration. So I want to be able to, and I need to be able to use duplicative services. Uh, the, the the short demo I'll show today 
has this, right? I have two different CMSs. I'm talking to Contentful and I'm talking to Drupal. Um, you know, for many organizations, they have one commerce platform, they have one CMS, um, you know, those types of things. But there are a lot of organizations that we work with that have multiple CMSs, they have multiple commerce platforms. And how do we bring those things together, right, and use them um, efficiently and effectively? And lastly, uh, vendor agnostic. Right, so um, the, the ability um, to, to move from one place to the next. Um, you know, vendors have, have software that we use and we love it for like a year and then we don't love it anymore. They do something that makes us mad, they charge us too much money, there's lots of different reasons why we, we might want to go. Um, and if we do, we want to be able to move, right? If we've built that orchestration layer properly and we've built in the integrations properly, we can do that. So, what are some of the benefits of the organization if we're composable? One is, you know, more agility, more faster, right? We can react to situations quicker. Um, I think back um, to 2020, there was a thing that happened. We all decided to do jigsaw puzzles and hang out at home, um, which was cool. But, you know, one of our, our customers, one of our clients is Shake Shack, right? And uh, if you've ever been to a Shake Shack, uh, you'll note uh, that at least the ones I've been to, they don't have a drive-through, right? And they're not built in a building that allows them to have a drive-through. And so when your whole business is having people come to your restaurant to sell them food and they can no longer do that, like what do you do, right? So we worked with them and we were able to get them um, uh, you, uh, a new functionality, curbside pickup, which was new to them. And all of a sudden, it opened up a whole new audience uh, to them, right? So the ability to be able to react to situations is really important. I think there's a, uh, a topic that got talked about BC or AI or something this week I was at, right? So there's, there's going to be new technologies, there's going to be things that are going to come up and they're going to impact our business, right, or our organization, and how do we react to those things? We also think about like A-B testing platforms. So um, this, if we've built our, our architecture correctly, right, we'll, we'll be able to plug in a new platform and test it out, right? Um, we'll be able to see if that you know, makes an impact or not, and do we want it or not. <coughs> there's also faster velocity. Um, you know, there's a lot of work to building up that orchestration layer. There's a lot of work to building the building blocks. But once they're there, right, we can expose those things to, um, you know, the different parts of our organization and let them build what they need quicker than, than we could, right? You know, taking those things that we do, um, taking those, those building blocks and using them to build out the experiences. And not only that, if we have one place where we're driving everything through, now as I add to my business logic, as I add new requirements or I add a new system, it's very easy for me to distribute that amongst the channels as opposed to having to go to every channel and add that, you know, that functionality. Um, lastly, is a better long-term ROI and investment, and, you know, I'm a tech dork, so I don't often think about business and business value, but um, this is a big thing, right? Like, if that layer in the middle that houses our, um, you know, business logic is a long-term thing, right, I'm going to get more and more out of my investment there, and the business type folks like that. From an IT perspective, there, there are, you know, some benefits as well. One is there's no vendor lock-in. So again, you know, if I'm building, you know, um, off of one specific um, technology, you know, I can often be locked into that vendor um, because they make it painful for me to migrate off of them. I can think of a few different examples in my past, but ultimately if we can, you know, make those, um, this platform's a commodity that I don't have to worry about that any longer. Uh, you know, it's easier to debug the user experience. Now, when I talk about this, I'm not really talking about, like, the website, right? Like, if I have a website, if, you know, if I build something in Drupal, it's pretty easy for me to debug that. But what I'm really talking about here is when the user experience goes across channel, right? When they're using my mobile app, and they're using my website, and I'm sending them an email, and we're connecting via text and things of that nature, like what's really happening and, 
you know, am I driving the, the value that I want, right? Are they dropping off someplace? Um, you know, are they having problems, right? I can have all of that happen um, and, and have a centralized place where I can get statistics and data. A better understanding of <coughs> the and governance of the digital ecosystem, um, you know, there are lots of, you know, especially in their large organizations, they have lots of platforms. Um, and if you have a lot of platforms, you want to make sure you're using them properly, right? A lot of the thing, these platforms cost lots of money. You know, am I using one particular feature of that platform, right, where I could get that elsewhere with something else I've already got? Or, you know, am I using a bunch of things, or am I not using it at all, right? So there's lots of ways we can build data uh, into um, and, and um, you know, build screens that we can go to to kind of keep track of all these things. So I've talked a lot about an architecture, composable architecture, and this is kind of how I think about it. Um, the, the term that uh, Mark and I have been using is layer cake. Um, we've got, at the top of the cake, we've got channels, right, mobile, uh, web, you, know, you name it, we got it. At the bottom, you know, we have the services. And in the middle, we have our orchestration. This is how we um, decouple the top from the bottom, and it's also how we drive value and we build out uh, our business smarts in the middle. So I'm going to talk about it from the bottom up. Um, so, you know, at the bottom we have our services. These are all the platforms we talk to, right? Um, CMS is common. Commerce is common. Um, but we have, you know, anything we can talk to. DAM, PIM, OMS, IMS. Uh, if you've been around commerce long enough, there's probably some more acronyms that end with S that I haven't labeled yet. Uh, this can be homegrown systems as well. Like this can be the system that we built up uh, long ago um, and still houses really important things for us. Um, the, as long as the service can be provided or the data can be pulled in um, to the orchestration layer, we can use it. It doesn't also necessarily mean that it has to be API driven, right? There are a lot of old systems that have a lot of valuable information um, and they're not API driven. Maybe I can get a CSV file and pull that out, right? So I might build uh, a quick database and have a process that brings in information out for me so I can use it. Uh, but the goal here is to use whatever features we need from the platforms. Um, and again, we're going to keep them um, separated and decoupled uh, so we don't have to worry about them. Um, the next layer up uh, is you know, what we would term maybe the capability management layer. Uh, this is where we're mapping the capabilities of the different platforms into, you know, features and functions that we want to expose into the, the orchestration layer in the middle or to the, you know, the package business capabilities. Uh, a couple of things are going on here. Um, one is integration, right? So something needs to know how to talk to Drupal. Something needs to know how to talk to big commerce or whatever we're we're working with, right? And so there's a very specific integration layer that's going to, um, you know, work with that that platform and understand it. Um, also, you know, what we have here is data mapping. So ultimately, what we want in the middle, and pretty much from from this point forward, is we want, you know, one definition of a product. We want one definition of a user, whatever those things are. And we're going to have to take that data that comes in different shapes and sizes, right, and, and merge it together in the middle <coughs> so we can have that, um, you know, smooth orchestration across um, the different capabilities. In the middle is where we build out our package business capabilities. <coughs> this is where we're taking various pieces of functionality and we're putting them together. We're sprinkling in a little bit of our own you know, business logic and our own value, right? And this is kind of where the magic happens. Um, you know, you can build these PDCs however you want, right? You can define the way it is. It can be by business shape, it can be by brand, it can be, you know, commerce and content, you know, by maybe platform type. There's lots of different ways to do this. Right, it's up to you to figure out how you you know best represent your business here, but this is you know uh, the the heart of 
a composable architecture. Again, as we talked about before, we want to build this so it's durable, right? We want to build this in a way that you know it's long lasting and it will outlast our platforms. The key to that is keeping the business logic out of the channels and out of the platforms and having that here in the middle. The next layer up is um, the business uh, APIs, right? This is how our channels are going to talk to and use all these package business capabilities that we built out. Um, it's really important that the APIs here uh, are done in such a way that they make sense to the business, right? So it's not about how does Drupal want to do this, how does Contentful, or how does Big Commerce, whatever. It's how do we want to define these you know, func this functionality, what makes sense to us to expose upwards to the channels. And lastly, we have channels. Uh, these are the, the various ways that we can you know, interact with, um, with our customers, uh, with our users, right? Um, again, you know, we've, we've talked about it. It could be web, it could be mobile, text, email, those types of things. But it can be digital signage, it can be store tablets, it can be voice. Um, it could be lots of different things. So whatever, whatever channel we want to meet our customers in, that's what we want to build out. And we don't know what the next thing is, right? Um, you know, so we want to be able to, to react to that. Um, also, uh, the orchestration layer doesn't care what you've written in. You know, JavaScript, cool. If there's a new thing that comes along that's even better, amazing. If, you know, uh, you don't like React, don't write it in React. If you don't like whatever, it does not matter, right? Ultimately, if we've done, if we've built that orchestration layer properly, if we've built the business APIs properly, um, you just get to use it and it's great. Okay. Who wants a live demo? All right. <laughs> You'll be underwhelmed, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so, um, what I've done here is, and hopefully, uh, I can pull it up. So, I've done two things. Uh, is that big enough? Can you guys see that? Should I maybe bump it up a little bit? Like it's it's just bright. That's bright? Well, the room lights are bright. Mm -hmm. Oh. Yeah, now they're not. All right. So, so, what I did here is I built um, a small orchestration layer. It has one PVC. It's blogs. Okay. Um, it's a pretty easy concept. We're all aware of that concept. And so, and I built two uh, APIs um, into the PVCs. And recognizing that I said that you want them to be business-like, and then you'll see mine aren't maybe business-like, but um, they're they're pretty cool. Um, one is give me all the blog posts. One is give me a specific blog post. So. Um, we'll start with the first one. We'll start with show me the blog post. With any luck, it works. All right. So this is a query. It went out, hit my my Node.js server, um, and it went and grabbed blog posts. Uh, I, as I mentioned before, I've built this out um, to use Contentful and Drupal. Right. So as we roll through. We'll see, I've got a Drupal blog here. I have my ID, so I can dig into that system if I want to. Um, the system is not something that comes back from Drupal. I just put it in for demonstration purposes so we know where it came from. I have a title, I have a body, um, I have an author, I have an image, right? Now, as you can imagine, Drupal is not sending it back and it doesn't look like this, right? There's a data mapping layer, we talked about that when we were talking about the integrations. So part of what uh, you know, this orchestration layer does is it takes what it gets from Drupal and it kind of remaps it into this common way of thinking about it. Now I have two different um, blog posts from Drupal um, and then you'll see I got lazy and the ones for the dogs are a little smaller uh, that are contentful. But again, there's an ID, there's a system, um, title, body, and things. And at the very bottom, it tells you that it's not cached. I built a small caching layer in there as well. So this has gone out to Contentful, it's gone out to Drupal, two very different ways of getting the data, two very different uh, formats of getting the data. 
and it's all pulled together as one. You can imagine if you were a brilliant front-end developer like Ryan, you can take this and you can make it look awesome. Uh, I'll just leave it uh, like this. Now, what's interesting, right, is in the, um, you know, in the uh, URL, I have some query parameters. Um, one is animal, right, and it's can be cats or dogs. Now, if I want to, I can tell um, the, the orchestration layer to just give me stuff from Drupal, right? So if I was a brand and it's coming from a brand site, I might only want the data that's you know associated with me. Um, you know, and this is stuff. You know, I have put it in the uh, the URL to make it easier for us to kind of demonstrate this. Um, but you know, you could build your orchestration layer smart enough that it would just do this for you, right? It, it would be smart enough to know which content that you want. Um, and then there's also a channel. Right, because if you think about it, if I'm building something for the web, I might want one set of data that comes back, maybe more robust. If I'm building a, a mobile app, maybe it's a little less robust. If I'm building a voice app, right, for Alexa or something, maybe I want something different, right? And so there's there's a feature that I built into this, which is channel mapping. Again, you know, behind the scenes, I have the same you know large data model, but now I want to direct to the channel, like the appropriate amount of data that they might get. This is like the API version of view models. Exactly, exactly. Yep. And that's actually how I talk about it, Mark, we have tested that. That's mm -hmm. how I talk about this. Um, but there's a lot of different ways. I think some some folks talk about lenses. And there, there's a lot of different ways that you can think about this. But for us, for us Drupalists, it's view modes. Yep. I'm going to do this again. Go back to web. So now. If I want to pull um, a specific blog post, I'm going to pull one from Contentful. So it's cool, right? It's a you know, slightly different call. Um, still have the same uh, query frames, um, and it came back, which is great. Now, you know, when you think about some of the stuff that you can do in an orchestration layer, you know, just like having, you know, it be headless and getting stuff, right, that's a little complicated for you know, that use case. Um, but one of the things that we'll show here is um, I have built into this, uh, if I can do this properly, um, the ability to retire content, <coughs> okay? And if I do this, and I think in theory, if I do this, and I restart my app, I come back here, and I refresh, nothing different happens, right? At least it first does. So I've gone out to Contentful, I've pulled in that request, I think, um, you know, that's awesome. But when I set that flag from false to true, what I was telling my orchestration layer, some of the logic I built into that, was I said, if we're retiring the content, I want you to move the content from Contentful to Drupal. Right, so if you think about what we do when we replatform, one of the perilous parts of it is like moving the content over. Right, um, part of it is understanding what you know we want to automatically move over. Part of it is wondering which content is actually used and which is not used. So if I come back to my full, um, get all the blog posts, and I scroll down a little bit, we'll see that that content's now been moved to Drupal, right? And if I come in to um, Contentful, it's you know already telling me that it's been unpublished, it's in graph mode, that's what that little box there falls on. Right, and if I go to the Drupal app, <coughs> I will see uh, that I now have, you know, those are the two that I had before, and now I have Bark at the Moon. So I've moved that content over. And so now, if you think about it, in like a year or so, you know, if I've got tens of thousands of, you know, nodes or whatever they call them contentful, you know, like I can say, oh, well, I moved the 2,000 that are really used and now I've got 8,000 I can figure out what to do with. 
do I want to keep them or not? Do I want to retire them or not? Um, you know, one of our clients um, had literally millions of documents that they wanted to, to move, and it's like, how do you do that? You know, in an organized uh, fashion. So that's what an orchestration layer, you know, at a small level can do. Provide it's, it's you know, orchestrating between platforms. It's you know, you're doing some smart things for you in the background, right? And it's really exposing that data. Um, to the channels, because again, they don't care where it comes from. They just need to know the data that they need to know. All right. You've seen the demo. You've been appropriately wowed. So what did you learn today? <laughs> um, all right. So composable, there's a lot of different definitions composable, right? Um, as I think about it, it's a modular way of building on a digital platform that gives us more agility and better velocity to the organization. Right? That can be done in a few different ways, right? Like, if your organization has, um, you know, an investment in like a Drupal, right? Drupal does this really, really well, right? It, you know, we can do it headless, we can do things. What you don't get when you use a composable DSP is a vendor agnosticism, right? Like. If I use Drupal as the orchestration layer, and if I funnel all of my business logic into it, I'm going to have a tougher time to move away from Drupal. But it's fine. There are ways to kind of mitigate that, how you build your modules and things. But ultimately, that's what you're doing. But if your organization is really focused on, you know, maybe the web and you know, maybe a mobile app or something, and <coughs> has one CMS, and doesn't have commerce, there's lots of reasons why, um, you know, I would use um, Drupal as a Composable DSP can be happy. If your organization needs more, you've got multiple platforms, you need to orchestrate things, you have you know, you know, tons of websites, all those good things, right? Like that's when we start to think about that composable architecture that we talked about. And then you saw a small demo that showed you a little bit of what you can do, um, which you can do. With that, I'll ask if there are any questions. one um, yeah it was a really cool demo uh, the, the thing that I thought about with uh, you know the idea of keeping the back end and front end you know framework agnostic is that uh, a lot of developers uh, that I know definitely not talking about myself uh, are pretty bad at that <laughs> so you know in this world how does that get solved does it just take you know, just a completely different thought process? Is there a way to kind of lead developers into thinking this new way? Yeah, so, so the question uh, was, when you're thinking about Composable, one of the things that we want to do is completely separate the front end from the back end, and developers um, tend to struggle with that, um, myself included, like how do you do it? Like is there, is there a way to think about it? I mean, one is, part, part of it is, you know, if you're, the architect of the lead, you, like you got to really dig into it, and you got to really make sure um, that we're thinking about that from the beginning. Um, really emphasize that um, it's not the end all be all. Like if some stuff slips in or whatever, a lot of this stuff as we've built out um, with a few different clients, you know, um, it's you know uh, could do this, could do that. You know, there, there's a lot of judgment calls in there. Uh, and one of the things that we've been talking about a lot um, over the past, I don't know, three, six months maybe, Mark, we've been talking a lot about how it's not like a binary switch. It's not like you're either composable or not. Um, so uh, we had a, a, a meeting. I brought a few of my smart colleagues together in August, and we were talking about this. And one of the questions I asked the team was, you know, if you were going to go from the web browser all the way through to the bottom and back up again and produce a home page, how would you do it? And it would seem to be easy, except it's not, right? Because immediately you're left with, like, what happens? Who's controlling the layout, right? Um, you know, and so we have a few, we had a few different answers, and I'm like, you're right, and you're right, and you're right. Like, it, you know, we could use a Drupal to control the layout. Right, you could pull that layout out and put that, you know, in that orchestration layer and have some kind of, you know, um, 
admin and UI that lets me lay things out appropriately and then have a standard way to send that back up you know to the channel so there's there's a lot of different ways um, I think you know it's an ultimate go ultimate goal right um, but it's you know you're right it's always going to happen um, the more you do it you know the less rework you have to do when you do the channels right so like if I go to add another channel and I'm you know doing like add to cart and if I've got logic that's sitting in here obviously it's not going to work here so you know I think even as your system evolves you'll you'll naturally start to to bring those things down but I even think about um, one of the things I love about this is um, I remember a long time ago in my career um, we built a website uh, our platform um, for Zipcar, and one of the things I did was I hacked Core, <laughs> and we had someone that really knew uh, Drupal come in to talk to our company. <laughs> they said, "Don't hack Core," and I was like, "But I did because I needed to." And they're like, "But you can't." And I said, "I did." And, you know, there's better ways to do it now. But if I think about the orchestration layer, and I, I thought back to that, like what I did then, I would just move into the orchestration layer, and now that business logic sits there, and it doesn't matter what the next. CMS platform is if I roll off of it, right? Like, it would be smart enough to do that thing. I would say, just pipe in, I mean, I think that business logic is really key, because that business <coughs> logic, what we're really talking about is commoditizing these services. We're like, 20 years ago, we were figuring things out as we went, and we were doing a lot of patching, and we were hacking the core. Now, we have these mature products that we can really look at as capabilities. Um, and then we can start to actually talk to the business users. So this idea of like that PBC is kind of a company's unique, is their special sauce. And what we're really trying to do is reduce the surface area of that. Because in the old days, like we've seen, we've all walked into like, we used to re-platform. Where they're like, oh my God. This system's terrible, but it's actually like many years of bad business practices and poor maintenance. They say now we're going now we're going to replatform. And I would argue that like we're past the days of replatforming because everybody uses so many systems. And the larger the organization, we all have histories and we all have a legacy. So it's like how do we use how do we use that legacy? That piece in the middle gives us a place to put that business logic. And that idea that you know the front end is really display layer, um, and that becomes really important as we start to talk about omni-channel, because some of the problems we've run into historically is when you change something where you have silos and you have ten different templates and ten different systems, and we're trying to create a connected experience, it becomes kind of impossible. So I think that that, that idea of reducing that surface area of what we own, of what the company, our client or our company owns, and reducing that surface area to just our special sauce, and then trying to commoditize everything else. Sorry, I, I, butted, in. I butted in. Mark is very smart. Uh, <laughs> listen to Mark. So, so, so how, I'm sorry, I was actually trying to figure this out while you were going in. How is this different from multi-tier architectures that people used to use? Um, I, I'm an old .NET developer, so that's all we ever did. Yes. Service oriented architecture. That's all we ever did. Yes. That which is old is new again. Okay. Right. I mean, good a lot of it. Good enough answer. Yep. Yep. Okay. Right. Better tools today. Yep. Uh, uh, uh. A lot of similar, a lot of similar, um, you know, uh, ideas and thoughts and concepts. Okay. Yep. But there's there's like also a cost. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thing. There's also a cost with this, though, right? Yes. I mean, these are all, like, this business layer is another layer of services that you're going to have to pay for and be able to support. Yes. Or build. And or build. Yeah. yeah, yeah the, so the bills, again. Yeah. But, but even then, I mean, build. Yeah, but no, that's more expensive usually as well. Yeah. 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 So, um, so the, the question is, uh, you know, about the orchestration layer and it being another level of services and cost. <clears throat> One of the things that we didn't, so, yes. Full stop, right? It's some kind of cause. Uh, the demo that I did, I wrote from scratch. Um, you know, I'm a build guy. Uh, but there are a lot of companies that do have products that help you with this, right? So you can you could do uh, you could build an orchestration layer within an iPass, right? So like a Mercado and connect the dots. I think Bank of Wind, this is what we talked about it as being right. So there's that. 
there are other, um, there's, uh, like, Wondergraph is something we've been looking at recently, and I think it's an elevated, you know, it's a, a step above the iPads of how it maps data and connects to different things and exposes, you know, to the front end. Um, so there's lots of different ways. So you're right, there is going to be something that you're going to have to do. And the, the question for, um, you know, for you is, like, you know, is the bit, like is what I'm trying to do with the experience, you know, as I'm trying to pull these platforms together, is it worth, you know, is it justified by that? You know, and a lot of times it's not, which is why Drupal is great at doing a lot of these things. And I think the principles, as much as you can adhere to those those composable architecture principles, will you know, make your composable DXP better off, right? It's, you know, even you know, the, depending on where you build it, it it's great. Um, but yeah, so there's a cost here, um, and, and again, like you don't have to get there overnight. You know, so there's like steps that you can do, and you can bring things in. Even what we've talked about as a first step for organizations is just going headless, right? If you can just get headless and have a thin layer between, you know, so you're not directly talking to the backend platforms, right? You can almost build a, a replica orchestration layer, like in React and in the front end to do that. You know, that's a step in the right direction. And I think one of the one of the things that kind of drove it is a lot of people, a lot of customers are asking for headless, but they're not thinking about like what happens after eighteen months. Like if anything's a, you can if it's a microsite, you can do anything. Like you can use the latest technologies. You really don't have to communicate. But when you get into these like when you're do, um, so the pendulum kind of swung from DXP where there's like a nice experience for the business users once we set things up to headless and all of a sudden it's a call a developer. You know, it's like, oh, I need to make any change, call a developer, and it's a developer-driven process. Mm -hmm. I think composability <clears throat> is starting to look at like, what are we talking about like, when we're doing like headless at scale? When we're not doing like an 18-month headless site and we accept like that front-end frameworks are changing so quickly that all we know for sure is someday it's gonna change. And if we're, if I think the average, uh, I, I heard a statistic, the average website has like 42, like commercial website has 42 different services that are driving every page. And if we have that many links in the chain, how do we change, you know, like how, how, how do we manage change? So, so for me, Composable is like, it's a question, there's always like, do I build or buy? Like, am I going to go with a platform or am I gonna build from scratch? Um, what is the project? How, how, you know, what are the disadvantages of like kind of buying? And I consider buying also like, you know, committing to an open source platform or whatever it is to commit to that technology. Like, what are the trade offs there? And I think at a small scale, like, depending on the scale, it makes a lot of sense to use a single architecture because you solve a lot of things. When you go to fully composable, and I think like, granularly composable, because there are people who do that, like the Mock Alliance, where they're like, we'll buy a million little atomic services. I don't think that works either. But some businesses are forced into this kind of granular technology portfolio. And I think in some of those cases at scale, composable is a logical answer for them. And I've also heard like good developers, when you when you talk to when you talk when you talk to them about these concepts, they're like I've been doing this my entire career just backwards, mm -hmm. where we're not saying it to the customers in front, we're actually having to reverse engineer to get that flexibility because we keep on being asked for changes that we haven't been able to plan for. I'm going to give a pretty good example from my experience in the past. We had, uh, we used to do a lot of work with uh, um, nonprofits and schools, and every one of them wanted to con consume stuff, data different. They wanted to consume data. They wanted us to provide the data, but they had their own way of displaying and, and channeling that data across. So we had a we had a business layer. We had a a, 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 a database layer. We had a, a, a number of layers to put out the data. But the one they, that they really cared about was just the consumption data, which in this case, you, it, it, much like uh, uh, the JSON he was using, yep. very agnostic. You just put it out as an API. Whoever they can use it any way they want. They can go from everything from an app to something that's uh, web-based, and we got a lot of business just doing that. So it was a lot of work up front, but then maintaining it was actually relatively easy. 
because you're chasing, you're, all you're really doing is chasing, changing your JSON, and that was very simple. So a lot of work up front, great uh, return yeah. afterwards. And I think what's, what would be nice about, what's nice about the adoption of Composable is that like hopefully with the like Gardner embracing it and PBCs, business and leadership embraces that value. And it's not, so, so there's an awareness that gives us a little bit of time to say, oh, you know, it's actually worth investing up front in, in some of these ideas and some of these schemas that's like our, because I think like the big idea for me is like a business needs, business leadership needs to accept, I'm not buying an API, I actually need my own business API. And like with that idea where it's like, oh yeah, like we want to talk about things in our terminology, like we don't call something a node, we call it a blog post, we call it a story, and being able to kind of translate the language of the capability into the language of the business brings business value. And with that, I think that'll empower us to be able to build better things that have a better life cycle and avoid some of the frustrations, because I think my career has been full of frustrations <laughs> at the end of a project where a change has been added that hasn't been accounted for. Very good, I think we're at time. So with that, I say thank you for joining us. And uh, have the good rest of your conference. Thank you. Thank you.